Um, the next person's uh, uh, joining us up from uh, Seattle, an Amazon Sumerian. It's Carl Roche. Thanks for having me. So, uh, yeah, my name's Kyle Roach. I'm the general manager of a product called Amazon Sumerian. Uh, I was just thinking last time I was on the stage like this, I actually fell off the back, like right through the curtain and everything. So had a little bit of a flashback there. Um, so look, when we, when we think about um, immersive applications, VR, AR, things like that, you know, how do we know if this is a real shift, if this is a real paradigm shift? And how do we know, more importantly, how it's important to our own businesses? So I, I thought this was an interesting report. This came out earlier this week. This is from VR Intelligence. And I don't know what, really why I was surprised. This, it makes sense after you kind of think about it. But with all the conversations that we have with other people in the industries, you know, we're talking about rendering quality and the headset prices going down and bandwidth and when's 5G coming out and all these kind of things that we know that will help move the needle later on. But what's really important to these enterprise customers is how do I prove that this is worthwhile? How do I prove that there's ROI? If I go to immersive application development, you know, how do I get my money back? And you know, more importantly, I think, is the opposite. The ones who do take that jump, um, zero of them said, like, oh, you know what, ARVR sucks, like, I'm out. Uh, they all basically said, yeah, let's keep going. We're going to keep digging deeper, keep investing more money into the space. So I thought that was really interesting to kind of tee up, you know, the movement that we sort of have and the parallels that we've seen to the last 10 years. Now, AR and VR is already super important and, and huge, obviously, in games, entertainment, and media. And that's been the, been the truth for quite a while now. Um, but you know, I, I think immersive computing is really another leap in the natural evolution of kind of how we converse with each other. And that opens up a really big opportunity for the normal developers uh, and people building kind of everyday applications, and especially the enterprise and indie, indie shops. So you know, I think what we've seen here is basically something that's played out uh, in a similar way over the last 10 years when you look at cloud computing. And Amazon's been a big part of that. How do we talk customers into you know, a, a paradigm shift 10 years ago when I had my secure data under my desk and it felt really like, okay, I gotta keep it here, this is mine, it's important, and, and move all that to the cloud. And that was an unorthodox move at the time, it was expensive, you know, ROI was very speculative, and you know, people were kind of hesitant to, to do that type of thing. And I, I think we see that sort of uh, similarity right now. So, um, immersive computing. This is about delivering information to users that is spatially uh, and contextually relevant at the given time. So one of the things the cloud is, has done for us is really enabled the secure distribution of content um, easily across you know, multiple endpoints. But we haven't really solved the, the place problem yet, the con contextual problem. So that's something that's still kind of being worked on. Um, let's see. OK, so let me bring this back to, uh, to the comparison between cloud computing and immersive computing, and then we'll get into Amazon Sumerian and why we built that. So now if you look at this over the last couple of years, what, what lessons can we take from what we've learned with cloud computing and apply to this move to immersive computing? Um, and it's really, it turns out that the operational expense is really where you want to spend your, your efforts, not a bunch of new capital. You want to move fast, fail fast, use the team and developer, development talent that you already have, the skill sets that you already have in place, and, and get things in motion, and then start to double down where you see the wins. So it's, it's a really low cost kind of way to, to get into the space and move the needle for the enterprise. So that's why we built Amazon Sumerian the way we did. It's a completely browser-based uh, 3D engine. Um, you can drag and drop everything into the browser, create your scene, uh, hit publish. You get a link that you can share immediately with your customers. If they have um, a, you know, Vive or something connected to their PC, they can jump right into VR right from the browser, or you can pop out into AR. So you can do everything from creation to deployment just in the web browser. So Marion uses a visual state machine to add most of the logic to the scene. So you can drag and drop things like, I want to start this animation flow or start this conversation, and then I want to you know, publish a message to, to Dynamo or something else. All that logic can mostly be done uh, with drag and drop components. If you really do want to customize it, you can just jump in, and it's JavaScript, so it's familiar to uh, web developers. So we have deep integrations, as you would expect, with um, a lot of the AWS components. We'll talk about most of the ones that, that we work with in the AI group uh, later on today. But you know, one of the challenges, like I was saying, if you're going to use the same development talent you have, you know, web developers, uh, standard back-end developers, and move them into 3D, you know, this is a very different skill set. And one of the main problems we see is content creation. So in the enterprise and a lot of the applications that we're seeing customers develop, uh, we're seeing everyday objects being used to create the scenes and create the layouts. Uh, and so we obviously we have a place where lots of everyday objects exist. So we're working with our friends at Amazon.com to model um, tens of thousands of these products and make them available to Sumerian developers to use in their scenes at no additional cost. 
So um, we have, I think, dozens now, but um, hundreds will be coming this year, and then, you know, like I said, tens of thousands earlier next year. So it's a huge effort. You can drag and drop these things into your, into your scene and use them, deploy them freely. So one of the key things here is that if you look at kind of how WebXR is moving, uh, we expect that like the revenue model, um, or revenue opportunity for, cu for customers like, uh, should be something like we see today with click-through ad revenue with bloggers. If you're gonna publish your scene through the web, you should be able to earn referral credit in a similar way uh, using kind of product referrals. So let me talk quickly about AR and kind of Amazon as a business. This is gonna only be like 30 seconds, but uh, we use it today for our customers. You know, our customers wanna see the products that they're looking at purchasing in their house in, in context of, of their other products. So you know, we've, we've added AR view to, to our app. We use native tracking for that, but we stream in the geometry and the products. Um, and this is kind of how we want our customers to be able to build their own applications. So one of the things Sumerian does is let you build that 3D app uh, using just your browser. We provide uh, open source templates for ARKit and ARCore, so you can use the, the, the capabilities of the local phone to do the surface detection, uh, the anchoring of content, and then we inject a transparent WebGL window. So that scene you developed in the browser that you could be using for VR, you can also use uh, in a native iOS or Android app. And this has been a super useful feature. It gives you kind of high quality tracking and we're not reinventing the wheel with something that you know, has been done uh, and done well already. So. so it looks a little bit like this. Uh, you know, basically making the same scene that could be making for anything. This could be a digital sign or a game or uh, you know, a, a VR app. The only difference is when I, when I get to deployment, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drag the, the scene transparency down to zero uh, and then I can move that one line of code into my Xcode project and build and deploy. Uh, and you can see it kind of working on, on iOS there. And these, these are both available on GitHub to, to check out and play with. All right, so you know, we're walking around in AR. Uh, you know, most of the time it's actually still like this. You know, like the, the wearables are just starting to come. Um, our, in VR, you know, our, our eyes are occluded. We're holding controllers or something like that. You know, voice became basically the natural medium for interaction. That's really one of the models that you know, we're, we're investing heavily in, in, into voice as a design, as the entry point for UX. Um, and so we've started to see this sort of natural evolution, this spectrum of how people are using voice to add layers of immersion to their applications. And you know, I think it starts with simple narration. So Polly is our text-to-speech engine. Um, you know, Polly, just typing text in, you know, it gives you something like uh, 54 different voices in 27 different languages. And just typing the text, you can stream and narrate uh, into the scene. So you know, that's great for like, you know, hey, go left, go right, the door's open, whatever. The scene is telling me kind of what to do. And a lot of times I want to talk back. I want to say, you know, turn the light on, you know, show me some different chairs or uh, open or close here, move me to another scene. So we have um, the instructional capabilities using our products called Amazon Lex, uh, Amazon Translate, if you want to, or Transcribe, if you want to take your voice and move it into text format. Now these tools can drive everything from a chat bot to a full on conversation. So you start to move into these really intelligent interactions with your scene where I can give it instructions, like I want to book a trip, and then it'll say, where do you want to go? I want to go to Vancouver. Like, how do you want to get there? I want to get there on a seaplane. This back and forth is all chained together just using your browser, uh, and with no code, you can attach that to different elements in your, in, your, in your 3D scene. So this gets to be a little bit more like we interact uh, in day to day. So one of the things we did when we launched Amazon Sumerian last year is we, we took these kind of first three pillars here on the interaction model, and we personified them into something we call Sumerian hosts. So Sumerian hosts are 3D characters. They're powered by the AI services for AWS. And with nothing more than text, um, you can basically get them to, to talk in any of those voices, any of the different languages that we support. We do all the timing with the lip sync naturally. If we, if we detect things like, you know, hi, my name is Kyle, the, the host will actually move their hand and emote in an appropriate fashion. Uh, there's, you know, idle animations and kind of eye saccades and a whole bunch of things that make the interaction model very natural. Uh, and very friendly to a, and approachable in the AR and VR scene. So um, this has kind of been a huge area for Sumerian and a big move, kind of uh, uh, movement forward for our customers to build these types of concierge types of experiences. So uh, today we wanted to introduce a new host. This is kind of um, fun. So Grace, Grace is our newest Sumerian host. Uh, she showed up last week at our summit in China where Polly announced support for Mandarin Chinese. So that gives us the 27th language for Polly. Um, there's 54 different voices. All these hosts can be interchanged, so you, you can pick a different dialect or different language if you, if you want to, but we kind of default them to, to things that um, you know, follow Polly's, Polly's lead with their deployments. Uh, so, so Grace joins basically Preston, Christine, and, and Luke um, as the four different Sumerian hosts. 
So um, customers can do all kinds of different things with these hosts. So you can customize their colors. Um, we, we provide a couple different outfits. You can put your, your own company logo on it. And, and, and they're free to use within your Sumerian scene. So you just pay for the metering on the voice, the text-to-speech, you know, that your Lex API calls. So there's no additional cost to put these in your scenes. So yeah, just today, in all the different public uh, AWS regions, you can drag any of these characters in and uh, use them in your Sumerian scenes. Some of the interesting things we've seen, especially around digital signage, is that Customers are deploying these to TVs um, that have a camera attached to it. So you can use our computer vision libraries to give the host uh, contextual vision into the space they're talking. You, know, you can go so far as to say, I want you to pay attention to this X, Y, you know, kind of coordinate in 3D space over there, and this, you know, follow the, the user that you're talking to, recognize who they are, and maintain eye contact through the conversation. So it's, it's a super powerful thing you can get kind of quickly and easily with just the browser. All right, so um, we do so much, uh, so many demos uh, around hosts. Uh, th a lot of the conversations and questions that we get from customers is around, you know, can I actually use all this voice stuff that you guys have built and put it into other entities in the scene or just you know, have it kind of work in general? So we came up with this concept. Uh, we, we did a screen capture of it. This was built uh, in Sumerian, though, so we'll show you kind of the demo. Um, and just, you know, how you might interact with a scene through voice and using some of the elements that we've talked about already today. So. So basically, we, we've laid out the scene. Um, we add what, what we call a dialogue component to it. Uh, we can pop out into the AWS console and build this whole conversation. So we can say things like, you know, hey, show me chairs or whatever. Um, so th this entire thing, you can group a bunch of intents. You can have um, different paths of the conversation that take you different, different directions depending on answers and things like that. Uh, but it's all just done in the browser. Uh, and you add that conversational element to the scene, and it just works. So I can do things like show me chairs. And it'll pop up and kind of show chairs from the inventory, uh, you know, wh whatever kind of library that you decided through, through your, you know, your configuration there. But then you can do things like, just show me blue chairs. Right? And I can say, select the first one. So then pop that out, put it in my scene. And all this stuff you can do with just the state machine, dragging and dropping. There's a, there's a little bit of logic maybe you, want, you might want to add if you're going to analyze the Lex responses. But the rest of it is, is pretty much configuration work. So from here, I can say, you know what? I don't really want to set up a scene you know, manually, piece by piece. I want to say, like, create a living room or something. So, so go ahead and pop up a living room. You know, maybe that's a little bit small. I can say, like, okay, make it bigger. So do the same sort of thing. And I, I'm not sure why we did this next one, but I'm going to say it out loud anyway. Uh, so we can say, make it feng shui. And then it'll kind of. And we're not actually sure if that's really feng shui. We Googled feng shui. And, and then we made a room that kind of looks like the image. So it, it could have been like a this is not feng shui article, for all we know. Um, so apologies if anybody actually knows what feng shui is. But like, you know, it's an example of kind of how do I, how do I add basic interactions uh, in, in easy things, animations, uh, you know, moving geometries in and out of the scene uh, with nothing more than kind of uh, voice. And, and again, this is uh, something that we did do um, in Sumerian. So it's, it's super easy with just a visual state machine, so pretty quick. And these assets are all samples that uh, come out of Amazon.com's um, furniture and uh, home catalog. So these are things you can use in your scenes as well. All right. So to date, um, when you publish a scene, we, we provide a URL. The URL is completely public, so anybody with access to the URL can see your scene. And one of the, the most common asks that we got hit with right away was, OK, like, how do I protect my content? Like, I want to either monetize it, or I have stuff that I don't want everybody else in the universe to be able to see if they can find it. So um, today, this morning, we announced a couple, or we, we launched a couple new features that we want to talk about quickly. Um, first is support for Sumerian in um, AWS Amplify. So Amplify is an awesome library. If you, if you haven't tried it, go check it out later on. Uh, it basically it gives you the scaffolding capabilities to build a complete serverless application with auth and like branded UX components with nothing more than a few commands to the command line. So it's, a, it's an amazing tool to get going. And so all we have to do now in Sumerian, you have a new publish dialog that's up on the right side of your, your scene. Now when you hit publish, you still have the availability to get the public link. So if, that's, you know, if that works for kind of how you're sharing or you're tweeting out your scene or something like that, that's still there. But we'll give you a JSON configuration file that you move into Amplify. Um, just a couple lines of JavaScript, it'll protect your scene. You can auth the user. Um, you can grab context. Then you can start to gate, put paywalls up, monetize your own uh, 3D creations, things like that. So we, we feel like this is a great opportunity for customers to really start building more um, enterprise-ready applications. Uh, you know, I think a lot of our training partners will start to do this you know, with classes and online, things like that. I think RMIT already announced a couple Sumerian classes. So we're very excited to kind of see what customers do with that. 
Um, great, so yeah, AWS Amplify is another product to, uh, to check out as well. Um, those two things work together. There's this tutorials already posted on both uh, their site and our site, so something new to check out. Okay, last thing before I go. Um, we wanted to announce um, a hackathon. This is our first Sumerian hackathon, so uh, thanks to our partners, you know, HTC Vive and obviously Brara and RMIT for helping with the, um, with the prize pool. But we actually gathered over $100,000 in prizes. Um, some, a good, very good portion of that is AWS credits and cash, so there's also a lot of prizes, but it's a significant prize pool. Uh, and we're gonna run the hackathon for a little bit longer than you know, we typically might do, just to give everyone a chance to kind of learn Sumerian, check out the AWS ecosystem, see what you can build. Um, and we tried to really spread out the different categories to give everyone an opportunity to do something that's you know, relevant to their day job or something that maybe they're passionate about. There's also secondary categories, so you know, if one of these don't kind of fit a specific niche that you're interested in, you can just go for like the best in class of VR, AR app or something like that. So, so again, this is uh, super exciting, it's live right now. So um, it went up like an hour ago, so you can go to that URL, check it out. Um, and that was it for me. So yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I'll be out back if anyone has any questions.